Okay. Hel hello and welcome to an introduction to academic librarianship sponsored by the ACRL membership committee. This is going to be the first in a series of webcasts on academic librarianship and these are based on the book The Future Academic Librarian's Toolkit, Finding Success on the Job Hunt and in Your First Job Search that was just recently published by ACRL. So we're fortunate to have the contributors to this book participating as speakers for these webcasts. Today's webcast is going to provide you with a broad overview of academic librarianship and the types of skills and credentials that are typically required for these positions. And then looking ahead, the next webcast in the series will be on November 12th, and that's going to cover ways to make yourself marketable for academic librarian positions. And in the spring, in March and April, there's going to be some webcasts that focus on the academic job search itself and ways of troubleshooting that search. So just kind of keep your eyes open for those. So just to introduce myself, my name is Dawn Barrett, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webcast. Um, I am an instruction and outreach librarian at Lenore Wright University, and I'm happy to also serve as the current chair of the ACRL membership committee. And I'm actually a second career librarian, so the topic of this webcast series is of special interest to me because I'm still actively shaping my own career in this field. So I'm really excited to hear Jenny's presentation, and I'll be taking notes along the way as well. I'll also be monitoring the chat for your questions and comments, and there will be a designated time at the end of the presentation for questions. Okay, so now I'm just going to introduce today's speaker. Jenny Callis is the Head of Reference and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin Parkside Library. She's also the author of the chapter, What is Academic Librarianship in the Future Academic Librarian's Toolkit, Finding Success on the Job Hunt, and in Your First Job. And now I'll turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, Don, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as we've said, uh, I've got the book cover up here. I wrote a chapter for this book. And I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested in academic librarianship, new or people who have been in this job for a while, uh, to look at this book. It has a lot of great practical tips and ideas and resources. Uh, just to repeat, please do ask questions in the chat box. I've got a couple points during the presentation when I'll be pausing for questions, and there should still be plenty of time at the end to get to those. I wanted to give you some ideas of my experiences and background. Um, and kind of the reasons why I ended up writing this chapter. Um, so I earned my master's in library science degree in 2005. And at that time, later that year, I started working at Randolph-Macon College. Randolph-Macon is a private liberal arts college in Virginia with about 11 to 1200 students. Uh, it only had undergraduate programs. It was residential, very what you think of when you hear traditional college. And there were four librarians on staff, so it was a pretty small library. In 2013, I moved to the University of Wisconsin Parkside, which is a public regional comprehensive college. It's part of the University of Wisconsin system. It's still somewhat small. It has about 4,500 students, both undergraduate and master's degree students, but we don't have any PhD programs. We have a lot of first generation students and it's primarily a commuter campus and we have nine librarians at Parkside. So just to give you some bullet points of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we've got, you know, characteristics of institutions in higher education and how they can affect the libraries. We're going to talk about the status of librarians, different kinds of positions and roles in academic libraries, and then I'll be offering some resources to help you learn more about this area. Uh, but before we do that, I've got a poll and I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but Gina should be posting it for you. Ah, there you are. So basically, I'm just wondering where you are in terms of your career and professional experience.
So it looks like most people have voted, Jenny. Okay. Um, well, I be able to see those or? Oh, can you not see the window? I see the I see the poll. I don't see the results. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> everybody should be able to see the results now. Oh, there we go. Okay, so a lot of you are still in library school, almost half, which is great, but a lot of people are also working in an academic library. So some of this information is gonna be a refresher for you. Uh, to those of you who are looking for jobs, uh, good luck <laughs> uh, in the best way possible. Um, we've got some people who've got work experience in other kinds of libraries too. Okay, great, that's a good variety. Thank you. Uh, so what I wanna start out with, oh, there we go, okay. Um, very broadly, the mission of an academic library uh, is to support, <coughs> excuse me, the academic pursuits of students, faculty, and staff. Uh, we usually think about this, first of all, in terms of the library's collections, that we're supporting the curricula of the university and the research needs of the people who are there. But of course, the library is meeting other needs as well, with spaces, with staff expertise, with technology, and other programs that will sustain and complement the mission of the parent university. Uh, academic libraries can also be involved with the community beyond campus. Um, particularly, I know at a lot of public universities, the libraries are required to be accessible to state residents. Um, but even at private schools, you may find yourself collaborating with community groups or local schools or public libraries with um, programming or events or edu educational programs um, for the greater community, not just that of the campus. And when we think about library users at academic libraries, of course, I think we tend, first of all, to think about students. Uh, usually, my brain always goes first to undergraduates, but we've also got graduate students, of course, plus the faculty and the staff of the university. I do want to highlight a couple of groups, uh, returning or non-traditional students, which are usually considered students who are older than the age of 25. And these students actually make up about a quarter, 25% of all students at four-year schools. And that was a number that was surprising to me when I learned it. I mentioned first-generation students a little earlier. Parkside has a large population of first-generation students. These are students whose parents don't have college degrees. Uh, they may be the children of immigrants, but they may not be. But this is a group that um, may need a little more help in terms of just navigating what college is supposed to be like. And then again, you may find yourself working with community users who are unaffiliated with the institution, but who might have specific needs that will bring them to campus and bring them to the library. So I want to give you a little bit more information about um, how higher education institutions are structured and characterized. Um, so one thing you may hear a lot about when you're at an academic institution is the Carnegie classifications. And at this website, you can look up the Carnegie classification of any university. Uh, there are a way of grouping institutions um, in considering several different categories, such as the kinds of degrees they offer, uh, doctoral degrees down through associate's degrees, um, how heavily those institutions emphasize research activity, what kinds of focus in the disciplines the programs have? Are they STEM, primarily STEM programs or arts programs or other areas like that? And then whether the students tend to be traditional or non-traditional. Um, the four categories in this pie chart don't quite match up with the Carnegie classifications, but it gives you an idea of the prevalence of these different kinds of schools. Um, I do wanna point out that community and junior colleges outnumber the others uh, quite a bit. And community colleges, um, you probably know, generally have fairly minimal entrance requirements, but they also have a very diverse student body. Nationally, over a third of students at community colleges are first generation, and more than half are non-white. And there are a few other characteristics of these institutions to pay attention to. First of all, whether they're public or private. Uh, we usually think of public in terms of the funding that they're funded, um, by the state, but this can also affect um, other elements of the university. For example, at a public university, you're going to be governed by state statutes, which can affect things like uh, purchasing procedures, which is significant in a library, uh, different hiring rules, and also benefits. You know, at Parkside, I'm a state employee, so um, there are certain 
elements of that that are you know good and bad. At a private school, you may find that you're at a private school that has a religious affiliation, although of course not all do. Uh, and schools that are religiously affiliated run the gamut. Some uh, are still very open to students and staff of all backgrounds. Randolph-Macon was actually affiliated with the Methodist Church, and we had a chaplain who said a little prayer at the beginning of our faculty meetings and other events like commencement, um, but otherwise it was very open. Uh, but other schools may have more stringent faith-based expectations for students and staff, so that's also something you might want to be aware of. The size of the larger higher education institution will also affect the library in all of these different elements. Uh, at a large university, you're probably going to find that you've got multiple libraries, and these could be divided up by subject area, by the kind of format or media that they offer, or who their audience is, such as an undergraduate library. If you're working at an academic library at a large school, you may find yourself working within one department, uh, with lots of colleagues who also do work in that area, doing kind of the same sort of work, most of the time are focusing on the same area. On the other hand, at a small academic library, there might not be enough staff to really have departments, but the staff are still going to be doing the same kinds of work that happens at large libraries. Large universities and also public universities will probably be part of a larger network or system or consortia. For example, the University of Wisconsin system. This can allow for negotiated pricing with vendors. Uh, in the UW system, we have a shared collection and a shared library services platform and a shuttle that drives among the campuses to loan items. So that's a really great benefit of being part of a large system, but be, still being at a fairly small school. And small colleges are often part of local or regional consortia as well. At Randolph-Macon, we had reciprocal borrowing with schools in the Richmond, Virginia area, which was a big benefit. Um, and there was also a state consortium of private colleges that could get together to negotiate with vendors. And of course, the level of coursework that the library is supporting is also going to vary depending on the institution. At community colleges, generally you're going to be talking about the first two years or general education curriculum plus vocational programs. Faculty at community colleges usually are not expected to do as much research, if any, as they are at four-year schools and of course that can affect uh, the collection development at those schools. Whereas at research universities, you're supporting everything from a first year freshman student all the way up through graduate students doing dissertation research and then faculty who are doing uh, major research. Where the library falls in the institution's hierarchy can also affect uh, how other people and other departments on campus perceive it and perceive the staff. Um, I do want to note that job titles at every school are going to be different. Uh, this is just a sampling, but in general, the library, which is headed by the library director or one of these other roles, will report to a provost or dean or some sort of chief academic officer. So the library generally falls under the academic side of a university's organizational chart. And you'll want to pay attention to where the library is in relation to other departments that it works with, particularly information technology, because the library and IT is going to be doing a lot of work together to make sure all the systems are working properly, um, but also with other units like student services, tutoring, things like that. These are not necessarily going to be um, reporting in the same way to the academic side of an institution. So you wanna make sure that uh, you're still gonna be able to work together. And at this time, I'll pause and ask Dawn if there have been any questions so far. I have not seen anything in the chat so far, so it's open for whatever questions. Okay, if anyone wants to type any right away, I'll wait a couple seconds and see if anything comes up. I'm not seeing anything. Not, so okay, go ahead. Then I will move along. Great. See, well, I actually see one question. Oh, yes, yeah, something just popped up. You're right about that. 
What can we do while in an MLIS program to help get into the field? That's a really big, big question. And I think, um, actually, that's kind of, it's not part of the next, um, the next presentation in the series, Don. Yes, the next is a little bit does have to do with the job search and trying to find that first job or get into a job. Yeah, I would say, I mean, based on my own experience, I would try to get into an academic library in any kind of role and just get some work experience as either uh, an intern or um, I don't know how many academic libraries take volunteers, to be honest, because it tends to be a pretty big investment of time and effort to train people. Um, but I would try to get some sort of work experience. When I was in graduate school, I was lucky enough to get a position doing library instruction as a graduate student. And I was working with uh, first year composition, English composition. And so those classes were also being taught by graduate students in the English department. And um, that was really beneficial to me. Um, any kind of library experience is going to be relevant. I think it doesn't necessarily need to be academic, but trying to learn about it and trying to get your foot in the door somewhere is really going to benefit you when it comes to looking for your first professional job. I have a couple other questions too. Okay. One person is asking about the difference in library funding based on public and private universities, how that can impact it. That's one question. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, I think, I think really every school is going to be different. Uh, and you're going to hear me say that a lot, to be honest today. Um, because I think, I'm trying to think in the University of Wisconsin system, I want to say that it's the campuses themselves that determine what kind of funding the library gets. And so while we're a state institution, the state isn't necessarily deciding specifically on Parkside's library funding. So there have been periods where we've gone through major budget cuts at the state level, but individual campuses have made decisions about to what extent they're going to cut the library. And so in my experience, it's not all that different from being at a private school um, where again, the library budget is going to be determined, um, you know, based on whatever kind of income the individual private university has from, you know, tuition and other sources. An additional question is how do you make the, the leap from public library to academic? And do you know of anybody who's been able to do that? Um, actually, I know someone who went the other direction. She went from an academic oh. library to a public library. Interesting. <laughs> One of my colleagues at Parkside. Um, just off the top of my head. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's a matter probably of marketing yourself in the right way and saying that even though you've had, um, you know, making sure that whatever experiences you've had in the public library, that you present them in such a way as to make it apparent that they're relevant to what's going on in an academic library. Um, That's good advice. And the next webcast uh, is all about being marketable for academic yeah. positions. So that may be a good one to check out. Yeah, we're always, I mean, when I've been on search committees, we're always, we're looking for people who have some sort of experience. And if mm -hmm. you've, you know, managed story times, probably you can manage other kinds of events, <laughs> for example. Okay, do, do you wanna take an additional question or move on? There's one more. I can do one um, more. Do academic libraries hire PhD graduates who had an MLIS degree? Uh, yes, and I think I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later, okay. but Sounds yeah, good. certainly. Okay, I think that covers all of our questions. Okay, great, then I'm gonna go ahead, see if I can go forward, there we go. Okay, so this section is gonna be about the status of librarians. Uh, just like with institutional reporting structure, how librarians appointments compare to faculty and other staff on campus can significantly affect how the library is perceived within an institution. And just some tips here, before you accept a position, you're going to want to know what kind of status you're going to have, whether all of the professional librarians at the institution share that status, and what kind of requirements and expectations there are for evaluation and promotion. So I'm going to start out talking about faculty status and the tenure process, and then we'll move on to non-tenure professional staff. Uh, so here are some numbers about how prevalent faculty status is at different kinds of academic libraries. And when I say faculty status, what I'm talking about is uh, characteristics that like these librarians are eligible for membership in the faculty governing body, faculty senate, that sort of thing. 
on the same basis as other faculty, that they have similar uh, employment considerations like salary and benefits, that they're covered by the same tenure policies at other faculty and promoted through a system with standards that are consistent with those of other faculty, that they have the same protections of academic freedom as other faculty, they have access to funding on the same basis, and also that they're eligible for leaves of absences or sabbaticals on the same basis as other faculty. I went through the tenure process when I was at Randolph Macon College, uh, but again, at every school, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, at some schools, it's completely the same for disciplinary faculty as for librarians, and that was my case at Randolph-Macon. At some schools, faculty have a slightly different process uh, or different, slightly different requirements for tenure. Uh, so the first thing I wanna mention is rank. Often when you look at faculty or librarians who are, have faculty status at those job positions, they may say, you know, to be appointed at the rank of assistant professor usually. So uh, new faculty are usually at the rank of assistant professor and librarians who, um, who are, have faculty status typically also have a working title that describes their role in the library. So when I was at Randolph-Macon, I was assistant professor and instruction librarian. Uh, but generally, again, new faculty are appointed at the rank of assistant professor, and then once they earn tenure, usually at the same time, they're promoted to associate professor. And then several years later, if you, you know, are still you know, doing good work and meeting the criteria, you can apply to be promoted to full professor. So that's how the ranks work. Uh, the evaluation criteria on the right side of the slide, you'll see you're generally going to be evaluated in each of these three areas, although again, uh, the, um, the criteria and the balance among these can be slightly different. So at some schools, teaching might be paramount. That was true at Randolph-Macon. If, if our teaching wasn't good enough, we weren't, it didn't matter how good our research or our service were, we were not going to earn tenure. Um, but at other universities that have a different balance, they may emphasize research or scholarship or pro professional service even more. Uh, so the balance among these criteria will be different. They may also be slightly different depending on the department that you're in, in the library versus um, in a STEM department or in the humanities, they might have slightly different emphases. I will also note, I remember hearing once, I can't remember where this was, that there was a university where instead of being evaluated on teaching, the librarians were evaluated on librarianship. Uh, so these are all gonna be slightly different at different schools. When you're hired as a new faculty member, uh, you're on what's called the tenure clock. And this usually lasts about five to seven years. It's the period before you apply for tenure. And during this process, you'll probably still have uh, reviews periodically, pre-tenure reviews, which can be uh, quite intense. Again, every school is gonna have slightly different procedures. These may occur, for example, at the second year and the fourth year, and then you might go up for tenure in the sixth year. You might have a pre-tenure review in the third year. It just really depends. And this is all a way of determining that you're on the right track to earn tenure. Uh, again, applying for tenure is a very long process. Occasionally, you can ask for the tenure clock to be shortened if you've got prior library professional experience. But I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you do, just because you want to make sure that you've got um, enough time to do the kinds of work and attain the kinds of accomplishments that are going to lead to a successful tenure application. One thing to keep in mind is that you may need to spend time explaining what you do as a librarian and how it meets the criteria that you're trying to show that you meet. Um, as you're going up for tenure, you're usually not being evaluated by other librarians. You're talking about other faculty in the university who might not really understand um, what work in the library means and what it entails. So just keep that in mind. Once it is time to go up for tenure, there are several elements of the tenure application. Uh, first of all, you're going to have to submit a portfolio that will include a written narrative of how you meet the criteria for tenure and other supporting documentation in each of the three areas. I'm sure most schools are probably doing this electronically now, but when I went up for tenure, uh, my portfolio was in paper form. It was a one inch binder, but I know, again, different schools have different requirements. I've seen it be 
several three inch binders. I've seen people who have had a box of files um, when they go up for tenure. So it really depends. Uh, you may also need to supply letters of support, both from people inside the university, such as faculty you've worked with, students you've worked with, uh, people in other offices who are familiar with your work, and also people external to the university. So these might be co-authors you've worked with uh, or published with, uh, people that you've presented at conferences with or organized a conference with. Sometimes you need to solicit those letters yourself. Sometimes you might uh, submit a list of contact information uh, to a committee and then they might solicit these letters, uh, but that will probably also be part of the process. And then finally, as you go through the process, you may also have to do interviews. So generally, uh, when you apply for tenure, you are first evaluated by your own department and hopefully they know you well. Um, then you'll move up the ladder, so to speak, or up the organizational structure so that there's a committee perhaps of faculty that deals with tenure and promotion. You may have to meet with them. And then if they approve your case, it moves on to the provost and then the president and then finally the board of trustees or board of regents or whatever it's called. Uh, so at any of those levels, you may also uh, have to do interviews with those groups. And I should say this whole process should be spelled out in a faculty handbook that um, you should be able to see or have access to or have explained to you again before you accept a position. It shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, so we saw some numbers earlier about the number of librarians with faculty status. Um, the American Association of University Professors estimates that only 21% of academic faculty at all institutions have tenure. Excuse me. Um, but at, um, with non-tenure track positions, um, you know, those are still good. I don't want to make it sound like you should only pursue positions where you'll have tenure. Uh, when I moved to the University of Wisconsin Parkside, I lost my tenure. I am academic staff. We are not faculty at Parkside. Um, and that's okay. Uh, it's, it's working out just fine. So when your professional staff or academic staff or however those kinds of staff are characterized, um, you'll probably have to do annual performance evaluations, just like many of you are probably familiar with from other jobs. And I should note, a lot of faculty also have to complete some sort of annual, it may not be an evaluation, but some sort of annual report of the kinds of work that they've been doing. Uh, so we have annual performance evaluations. Um, we also have continuing contracts. So there's still a high degree of job security. Um, you know, we're hired with a probationary period. And then once you do well, um, I think I sign a contract every year, but it's really good for the next three years. So it's kind of a rolling contract. Uh, sometimes this is called an indefinite appointment. Uh, so there's still good job security. Uh, you may still have the opportunity to move through ranks and to be promoted. Again, different schools are going to have different terminology for this, but at some places you might start as a librarian one and then be promoted to librarian two and three. Uh, sometimes the titles will mirror the faculty ranks, so assistant, associate, and full. At Parkside, our ranks are completely different, but basically after your third year, if, you're, if you were hired at the lowest rank after the third year, Generally, if you're doing well, you get promoted. And then to move on beyond that is kind of at the discretion of your supervisor <clears throat> and you. Um, and I also want to note that there are uh, some schools where librarians are considered faculty but don't necessarily have tenure because they're on uh, just another kind of contract. I've got a link here to an article. This gets a little more into those different dimensions and elements of faculty status that I mentioned a few slides ago and how prevalent they are among librarians at different research universities. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I would take a look at this article. Okay, so obviously once you get a job offer, you may not be in a position to accept it or decline it based on the kind of status that you would have in that position. Um, but there are some things you're going to want to think about. First of all, do your preferences for the kind of work that you want to do match up with the expectations of that position? So if you are going to be expected to do a lot of research and publishing, maybe it's a tenure track job at a large research university, uh, is that the kind of thing you want to do? Are you going to want to spend time doing that? 
uh, what kind of support are you going to have for professional development? And this is true for both faculty positions and for staff, professional staff at positions. Is there money available within the library to support travel and professional development? Are there internal grants that you can apply for at the university? At Parkside, we have a separate pot of money basically for academic staff throughout the university to use to apply for it for travel, which is a, a big benefit. Uh, is there just a set faculty limit? You get X hundred dollars per year and that's it. And support for, prof for professional development also includes things beside, besides money. Um, are you going to have to use personal days to attend conferences? Will you get comp time if you're at a conference over a weekend? Um, are you going to have time to conduct research? Are they going to give you time to conduct research? Is there any sort of pre-tenure leave available, which may extend the tenure clock if you get to take, for example, a semester off uh, to do research? Will you get to have sabbaticals after you've earned tenure? And also, will the library cover or contribute to any association membership dues? That can be a big benefit as well. And then finally, the work-life balance. Again, is your schedule going to have enough time for you to do the sorts of activities that will lead to a successful evaluation, uh, including service, but also service outside the library, excuse me, research and service outside the library, maybe with other campus groups? Um, how flexible is your workday going to be? Is there going to be an opportunity for you to telecommute? Uh, even something like covering a reference desk, uh, how stringent is that schedule if you're expected to be on the desk? And let's say you're appointed to a committee that has a regular standing meeting. Are you going to you know, be able to get somebody else to cover what would normally be your regular shift? Uh, you're going to want to think about those things. And now I will take another break for questions if there are any. Okay, it looks like um, it says, what tips can you give for someone who is looking to transition from a small college to a larger university library? Um, and she said that she did not study academic librarianship for her MLIS. Um, it was in special collections and archives. And then she just got into academic librarianship that way. Yeah, I think, um, I think most schools are going to have you know, special collections and archives. So if that's an area that you're interested in staying in, I wouldn't think you'd have any trouble. And in fact, it might be a big benefit because at a small school, you've probably got to deal with all of the special collections. And at a large school, they might have somebody who deals with manuscripts and somebody else who deals with uh, the records of the university and somebody else who deals with, uh, I don't know, the art books. Uh, I don't work in special collections, so it's not an area I know a lot about. But I think the key really to getting any job is just making sure that you present the experience you've already got in such a way to make it applicable to the position that you're going for. Okay, and somebody was just asking if your slides are gonna be available at some point. Yes, uh, the webinar is being recorded and I'd be happy to provide the slides as well, especially toward the end, I've got a lot of resources on the slides, okay. so Sounds yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else? I don't, well, see, um, how can you figure out if you are new to academic librarianship, what position would be the best fit? Uh, I think what I would do, and again, I'll touch on this a little bit later, is I would try, just try to read job ads and see what, get a feel for what kinds of positions are out there. Um, there is a section in the book where there are several chapters that talk about different kinds of public services jobs like instruction and liaisoning, which I'll talk about briefly later. Uh, but there are also a few sections on other kinds of jobs in academic libraries that are presented sort of as a, a day in the life of somebody in this role. So um, I'll plug the book again. Feel free to check it out from a library. You don't have to buy it necessarily. Um, and then I think just reading job ads and seeing what kinds of things are out there uh, is a good start and see what you think might be a good fit for you. Okay. This is kind of a question all of us wonder, how competitive is the job market? Um, I think it really depends on the kind of job that you're looking for. Um, and also where you are geographically. If you're in an area where there are a lot of library schools, yes. and obviously you're looking for a new job. I know in Wisconsin, we've got Madison and Milwaukee are both doing giving library degree, not giving, people are earning <laughs> library degrees there. Um, so we get a lot of applications just from within the state mm -hmm. of Wisconsin and very few from other places. Um, at Randolph-Macon, we tended to get applications from all over. Uh, 
so it it depends on the, it really depends on the job and depends on the school. And I think it depends too on how specialized the position is a very broad based, you know, reference and instruction at a small to medium sized school where you're going to be doing a lot of different things is something that a lot of people are going to be um, have the experience for right out of library school, but something like data management or scholarly communication or a copyright librarian that might take more specialized knowledge. So I would imagine that those pools are probably a little smaller. Um, let's see. So somebody's asking for those still in school is applying for a full time position with still one full time semester left something that can hurt chances since they don't have a degree yet. Uh, I would say probably it's not going to hurt your chances. But if you don't meet those minimum requirements, mm -hmm. probably they cannot interview you. I know right. that how it is at Parkside. If you we've got you know, these things are required, these things are preferred. And if it says required a master's degree, uh, there's really no point in applying because we can't look at your application. It will get screened out right mm -hmm. away. Um, some schools might say that if you, you know, you need an MLS by the time of the starting date. So if the starting date is in August and you're gonna graduate in May and they're advertising for it in February or March, then you're gonna be fine. Well, other questions. Do you want to take those or hold those till the end or? Uh, why don't I power through the rest of it? And okay, then we'll, I'll, I'll we'll hold on to these for the end. Get to the end. Okay, okay. great. Thanks. Uh -huh. um, okay, so a lot of you are already in academic libraries, uh, either working at them or studying them. So you're probably familiar with this. Um, these are just some of the broadest kinds of categories you're going to see at most academic libraries. Again, I want to repeat that the job titles may not be the same at different institutions. So you definitely want to read these job descriptions with great care. I'll also note, especially at smaller libraries, some of these may be combined. Uh, for example, I am the head of reference in instruction, but I also do a little bit of cataloging. Um, and I also help train our student employees in the access services department. So we're really crossing all over the place at smaller schools. Uh, some of these positions may also be held by paraprofessional staff instead of uh, degreed librarians. Uh, somebody asked, or it came up in one of the questions, I mentioned liaisons. And these are, a lot of academic libraries use what's called a liaison model. And these are uh, librarians who work with specific departments or specific colleges of a large university, uh, generally to do collection development, instruction, particularly upper level instruction, um, and then other research help or helping faculty with needs specific to that department. And these are the kinds of positions where an additional master's degree or PhD uh, could be preferred or sometimes required depending on the school. So if you have an additional advanced degree, um, you know, that could definitely be a benefit and I would definitely bring that up if you think that it's going to be applicable to the job that you're applying for. And in the book, there's a whole chapter about liaisons and uh, working with faculty and things like that and the kinds of work that they do. There are also a lot of specialist positions you may come across. Again, this is just a sampling. Uh, this is an area where job titles can really, um, you know, can really run a gamut um, in a lot of different areas. At large research universities, you may find that there's you know, multiple people doing each of these things in small teams, and they're really dedicated to one of these areas. At a small library, again, you might not see anyone with these job titles, but the work is probably still being done. Um, you know, at Parkside, we don't have anyone whose title is first year experience or student success librarian, but there are several of us who, you know, are working in those areas. Uh, same thing with scholarly communication and with technology. Um, and again, some of these and others are covered in the book if you want to learn more about these. So again, things to think about as you're applying for jobs. Um, what kind of data at day activity do you like? Are you going to want to sit at a desk all day? Do you prefer to be out and about? Um, will you be collaborating with colleagues in the library or outside the library? Are you going to be the only person doing um, one element or all of your job, depending on the size of the school. And how varied do you want your days to be? Again, I've worked just at fairly small libraries and I like that I get to do a lot of different things throughout the day. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier that you can read job ads um, and in a minute I'll get to some sources that will help you find job ads if you haven't already looked for them just to get a feel for what's out there. There's, you know, so many different kinds of combinations of positions and roles in academic libraries. Uh, you can also do informational interviews with librarians, either face to face uh, at whatever school you're at or nearby or virtually if you are just browsing the web and see somebody whose job sounds really interesting. I would encourage you to make it easy for them. I know when students have contacted me about meeting, it's easiest if they send the questions ahead of time so that I can make sure I'm addressing the sorts of things that they're interested in. Um, again, you can meet virtually, you can meet over email. And then of course there's social media. So you can follow individual librarians. Um, you can uh, join online journal clubs where people read new journal articles about librarianship and then discuss them. There are Twitter chats on topics relevant to librarians. I mean, the internet really makes this, you know, a vast, um, vast buffet of sources. Uh, one thing to mention when you're doing, if you're interested in doing informational interviews with librarians is think about the time of year. Uh, the academic calendar really drives a lot of what we do in academic libraries. This is a chart of the research, <coughs> excuse me, of the questions we've gotten at our research help desk at Parkside from uh, July through June. And so it's quite easy to see where the semesters were, uh, where winter uh, our winter term was, we, even where spring break was. Um, so keep in mind that you probably don't want to send a cold email to somebody you've never talked to asking them for lots of help in the first two weeks of September, just for example. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is just depending on the kind of role it is, their busy times might be slightly different. If they're implementing a new library services platform or a new discovery search, uh, they're probably doing that over the summer and it will you know, that will be the busy time for them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I've listed a couple sources here for you to keep abreast of trends in academic libraries and higher education, because being aware of trends can really inform the kinds of questions that you ask and the kind of questions that you get asked when you're interviewing. Uh, ACRL's um, Top Trends in Academic Libraries comes out every other year. And the Chronicle of Higher Education covers all of higher education and they do a trends report every year. Uh, and there's also an article here that um, if you are interested in trying to track tens, trends on your own, uh, this is a good guide to how to do that. And so we're definitely moving into the learning more part of the presentation. Um, so a few tips, uh, explore and join professional organizations such as ACRL and ALA, of course you know about those, but also look at your state associations. Um, all of these groups are probably gonna have student rates for membership that are gonna be more affordable than the rates you'll have to pay once you earn your degree. Um, ACRL has free publications now, which is great. You can read those online and uh, the state associations may as well. And they also provide great opportunities for professional development, um, like this webinar, for example. Uh, they will also produce conferences. And again, you don't necessarily need to go to a national conference to uh, learn more about these kinds of libraries. State and local conferences um, are available to you. I've also seen advertised more and more virtual conferences. And a lot of conferences will have a special opportunity specifically for students. So there may be scholarships to help cover travel or registration. There may be volunteer opportunities. And there may be special sessions set aside specifically for students to be the presenters um, and share the work that they're doing and get to know other librarians in the field. Uh, listservs are a great resource. I know they're old technology, but I still really like them. And ALA has a lot of listservs. They cover different kinds of libraries, such as community colleges, uh, colleges, universities. They have ones dedicated to certain kinds of work in libraries, such as cataloging. Um, they have ones for, you know, instruction and for first year experience and uh, reference services. There's all kinds of different listservs. Uh, you can sign up for as many as you like. And they're a great place both for discussions, for people to ask questions about how they handle situations, to get ideas for how to do things, um, but also for professional development opportunities and again for job ads. 
a lot of jobs get advertised over the listservs. I think I subscribe to several different listservs and I think almost every day uh, there are new jobs being advertised on those. So that's a great place to look at to get an idea for uh, what kinds of roles people are, you know, are, are looking for in academic libraries. Uh, Library Journal has an academic newswire newsletter that comes out once a week that links to articles that both that they've written and um, articles and other publications about academic libraries. And then try to get a feel, if you're not real familiar with the field of higher education, um, you can look at these sources to get a feel for it more broadly. The Chronicle of Higher Education is a newspaper that comes out once a week, but a lot of schools will have a site license for it. So you could look into that. And then insidehighered.com is a free website that also has a lot of news about higher education. Uh, they have a daily newsletter you can subscribe to. They have other newsletters focused on different areas of higher ed, like faculty and administration. Uh, they also have some columnists that I really enjoy reading, reading, so that might interest you as well. And then I've got a few tips for learning more, but if you've got any additional recommendations for resources, you can go ahead and add them to the chat. Um, there are some open access journals. These are just a few that I read, um, but I know there are others. Uh, these are all newsletters that you can sign up for from ACRL and from their sections. And again, I'm sure there are more. Uh, and again, uh, a citation for the book, The Future Academic Librarians Toolkit. And that's what I've got. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I'm happy to answer any final questions. And I've got my email address up here. If you want to email me later, if you think of something else, uh, or if we don't have time to get to your questions, I don't know how many are left, uh, feel free to do that. I'm happy to answer further questions. Uh, there's also a link to evaluate this presentation. Um, ACRL staff are going to email the link to the participants after the webcast. And it will also send a link to the recording of the webcast to those of you who registered for it. So I'm ready for more questions. Okay, so it looks like um, somebody was asking, and I think Mary Jane was answering this um, as well, but how teaching experience could affect applications for an academic librarian position. Uh, I would say it's probably going to be a positive if you're looking for a position where some teaching is going to be expected. <laughs> Right. Uh, I, I, don't th I don't think it would ever hurt you. Mm -hmm. And then would you recommend anything in addition to internships to differentiate yourself? Um, I don't know. I think if you are, um, you know, there's always other opportunities, like just if you, you know, for example, on your personal time, if you volunteer, um, you know, doing a certain kind of volunteer work, you know, think about how that could, um, perhaps translate into something that you could bring to the university if you're familiar um, with working with, you know, for example, underprivileged groups and that you're applying to a university that has a large underprivileged population of students um, or first generation students, you could say, you know, I've got this kind of experience working with these students. Um, I think it's, again, I think it's a matter of really translating the, in, the experiences that you've already got and just trying to present them in such a way that they seem relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're welcome to jump in too, Don. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree with that. With yeah, any experience you have, you can just leverage that and try to, you know, um, apply it to the job you're, you're looking at to make it relevant, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and then do you have tips for someone who is a solo academic librarian looking to transition to a more traditional academic librarian role? I really admire solo librarians. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how you are, how it's possible to do everything that you all do. Um, and so I think that's great experience. I mean, in my library, I know we've at Parkside, we've talked about, you know, how important it is to cross train and make sure we can cover each other's areas if something comes up. So that's, you know, certainly something you could um, mention. Um, and I'm sure even as a solo, solo librarian, you're probably still working with people outside the library, such as, you know, faculty or staff in other departments so that you can still say, you know, works well with others, I'm a team player. Um, that sort of thing. I, I can't think that um, off the top of my head, I can't imagine how it would hurt you. Mm -hmm. Somebody was just asking if you would provide the social media links that you were mentioning. Um, yeah, I actually, I am not a big user of social media. Mm -hmm. So I um, 
don't really have any off the top of my head, um, but I'm sure others who are on this um, on this webcast can add some into the chat. And I'm sure you can Google librarian social right. media. <laughs> right. It may be in the next <laughs> webcast too. Yeah. Marketing and yourself. be completely overwhelmed. <laughs> right. Um, and then I think Mary Jane also is answering, but any good resources okay. to see what salaries are available. She posted a couple of resources from ALA. And yeah, I, yeah, I know Library Journal does a salary survey mm -hmm. every year. Public universities probably have to make she, their salaries yeah, public. They do. Yep. They do. Yeah, I know my salary is public. It's, you know, sometimes it's a year or two out of date, but you can still get an idea. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, the only other thing was if you can, um, there was something about a practicum using a practicum as well as an internship. Um, I don't know if there'd be a big difference between those two things, but. Yeah, I think that would definitely still be, I think, yeah, with a practicum, you might be getting credit and you're meeting as part of a class in mm -hmm. addition to your work time. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that would be relevant. Okay. And the only other thing is I see so far is um, for any kind of teaching at an academic library, library, do you ever need to be state certified? Uh, not that I've heard of. Right. I'm not. not aware of that either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not either. Yeah. Because you're usually not teaching. Um, well, I'm usually, I'm not teaching. We don't have credit classes in the library, mm -hmm. but even if you did, it's more like being a faculty member right. who's doing teaching. So they, you've got, with the MLS, you've got the terminal degree and that's usually what's required. Um, let's see. So it's kind of moving fast now. <laughs> so, uh, somebody's moving from a major city with higher wages to a smaller city is with lower wages. Is it re reasonable to expect maintaining your salary level as you move to a smaller school, I guess, with lesser pay? Um, yeah, I, that's a tricky one. Um, and somewhat relevant to positions that I've been in. Um, I don't know that you necessarily could maintain the exact right. dollar amount, but you know, compare, check out, mm -hmm. there are a lot of cost of living calculators online and check that out to see what kind of an equivalent salary mm -hmm. might be. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and you may also be surprised by the salaries you can get even at, I mean, I moved um, from, you know, suburban Virginia, not suburban Washington, but in Virginia, I was in, you know, a somewhat suburban area and I moved to Wisconsin and I thought, oh, Wisconsin, but um, I'm, doing pretty well <laughs> better than I expected right. so uh and sometimes um you know the kind of school that you're at you know public schools I think tend to will usually pay a little better than private mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. there's a lot of factors that go into salary <laughs> yeah that would be a whole webcast all in, in, in yeah. and of itself probably but um I think that's all the questions that I've seen unless anybody has anything else um that they want to mention another one about relocating geographically but um I think that's kind of related to what you were just talking about there. Mm -hmm. So I mean that uh, that is something I've done. So if they've got questions besides uh, salary about this, this relocating is e geographically, is it <laughs> easier if you were able to relocate. So I think if they're saying if they're looking for a job, are they more likely to get a yeah. job free to relocate? <laughs> I I mean less. I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Especially like you mentioned, like I'm in North Carolina. There's a ton of library schools here, so you almost have to go somewhere right. else. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're down to our last few minutes here. I just wanted to mention, though, that um, this is the first in a series of webcasts, like I mentioned, and we're going to have lots more coming up for you, one in November um, and a couple in the spring, so just kind of look for those. Um, we do have the link to the evaluation. If you can fill that out and give us some feedback, that would be great, and we'll also send out that link uh, to your email. So I just want to thank everybody for attending and for all your questions, and uh, to thank Jenny for uh, such an interesting presentation. I think that will end our, our webcast for today. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.